Hey, everybody. Welcome back to uh, Submarine History. Uh, today, we have an author interview uh, and a book review. Very excited about it. The uh, book is Night of the North Atlantic, Baron Siegfried von Forstner and the War Patrols of the U-402 uh, from 1941 to 1943. And with us today to talk about this book is the author, Aaron S. Hamilton. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Steve. So um, let's just dive right into this. Uh, tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Um, I'm a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel from uh, from the uh, the Army Reserve System. Been in there for 28 years. Retired last year. I've always had a passion for military history. Um, I have a BA and MA in history, and began researching and writing books. My gosh, about uh, 20 years ago. And primarily, uh, most of my research and, and writing had been uh, land-based combat. And that sort of transitioned in the last 10 years. Uh, I've been a certified diver since 1989, loved wreck diving. I took a hiatus for about a decade. And then about uh, 2013, 2012, decided to get back into uh, the diving and get into technical diving at the, at the same time. And then also, I ended up um, joining the uh, Nautical Archaeological Society and getting training in nautical archaeology as well. And so my love of military history, uh, diving and nautical archaeology actually kind of combined in a lot of ways uh, and brought me to this point in, uh, in writing the book. Uh, I, that, that's excellent. And uh, I think it's kind of funny because, you know, I'm a retired warrant officer and uh, I think it's too funny, <laughs> funny two retired uh, army officers sitting around talking about the uh, German Navy. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I have some questions I'm going to ask you uh, about the book. But before we do that, uh, I want to give you, I did read the book and um, I wanted to give you three things I really liked about the book. Uh, first of all, your strong personal connection to the subject matter is, is compelling. And I, I feel like when I was reading the book, I'm not just reading about Forstner, but I'm, but I'm also reading a little bit about your own family history. Um, number two, there's really excellent photography in this book. I cannot emphasize the, uh, the number of photos that you have and the clarity. It's really remarkable. And I can tell that you did a lot of work uh, just going through photographs for the project, just to find the right ones. And, and you nailed it with this book. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the third thing um, that I liked about the book is that, uh, you know, it, the book just brings out the senselessness of war. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it was a conflict that um, I don't think a lot of people wanted and you know you you you'll read about how um many of the uh the crew members were drafted and assigned to u402 including my own grandfather right he was studying to be a butcher there was no military uh tradition in his family he was uh, the only son of a, a fairly large family of, the, of seven seven children all of whom were were girls except for himself and he was studying to be a butcher when uh, he received his papers to uh, to get mobilized, and he was assigned to the Kriegsmarine, right? And, and there were yeah. many like him who found themselves in this conflict that uh, would have preferred to be doing something else. So, what was your inspiration uh, for writing *Night of the North Atlantic*? So, I always had an interest in. Uh, my grandfather's uh, military service uh, and had begun researching U-402 back in the 90s. And back then, uh, I was able to correspond with uh, individuals in Germany, including Otto Kretschmer, who at, was, um, you know, the most famous U-boat captain yeah. of the war, right? High scoring ace. But one of his watch officers on one of his patrols was Siegfried von Foster. And they had developed a very close relationship. And I discussed this uh, in the book. And thanks to uh, my correspondence with Kretschmer, he detailed that extensively and uh, credited Kretschmer, uh, Kretschmer credited von Foster with picking up many of his 
uh, his own uh, tactical skills that uh, that he observed on that first war patrol. So I continued to collect uh, documents and information over the years, but never really thought about writing a book. It was more researching this on, on my own until 2013. So as I noted earlier, I decided after a hiatus to get back into uh, diving. And here in Northern Virginia, we have a U-boat in our own backyard, which is uh, the U-1105 okay. in the Potomac River. And that's a subject of another book I've written. But at the time, uh, I wanted to dive that U-boat and it was looking for uh, some uh, refresher training and found a course that was taught here in Woodbridge by a good friend of mine, Bill Chadwell. And it was a U-boat diving course which detailed all the diveable U-boats on the eastern seaboard, but also uh, gave you wreck diving as well as uh, nitrox, advanced nitrox. So I went and uh, took his course. And at the end of the course, he said to me, and, and I'll preface this by saying that he had no idea about uh, my background or that my grandfather had served in the Kriegsmarine or was on a U-boat. I didn't share any of this uh, at the time with him. And at the, the completion of the training, he had said he had gotten a call from someone at NOAA who was looking for a group of volunteer divers to go out on North Carolina and uh, map uh, a wreck. And I thought this was this was fantastic. I said, you know, this is going to combine a lot of my interests. And uh, I said, sure, I'd be interested in coming out and, and doing this. So I said, what wreck are we going to dive? And he said, the first wreck we're going to do is the Ashkabat. So, you know, you sort of think about, you know, all of the, the things that would have to line up for this to happen because the Ashkabat was a wreck that U-402 sunk off of North Carolina in April of 1942. And I said to him, I said, you know, this is, uh, this is more than fortuitous because I have a connection to this wreck. And uh, so we went down, uh, a group of us, about uh, six, seven of us, I believe, and uh, we spent a week mapping that wreck for NOAA. And the dive card that uh, we produced is, is in the book. And I talk a little bit about uh, sharing the video footage of that wreck with my grandfather before he passed away as well. So when, when I dove on that wreck, uh, I decided at that point I would have to go ahead and ultimately write a book about U-402 and its experiences. I just felt I needed to do it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't get around to doing it until uh, COVID struck. Uh, yeah. For many of us, you know, we, uh, 2020, we had some extra time on our hands as we, as we stayed home. And so for my COVID lockdown, I decided I was going to go ahead and pull all my research together and write a book. And I did it in about six months, which for me is a record because, you know, being, uh, having a family uh, and, you know, at the time holding down a reserve uh, job as well as yeah. a full-time job, you don't have a lot of time. So writing a book from start to finish usually takes me about five years. So in this case, it only took me about six months to do. And uh, and here we go. Here we are. Yeah. And you, you kind of answered the second question, which was, uh, what was it like uh, writing the book? But <clears throat> I have a follow-up question to that. The um, The photos that you have in the book, a lot of them are marked, I think, your personal collection. Did you actually, would you have actually been able to go to Germany to like uh, Cuxhaven, to the archives? To get foot to get additional photography, how how did you handle that? So uh, I was lucky in the fact that uh, I had gained access to Freebelin's photographs through his family a um, couple years earlier, and already had high def scans uh, from his personal photo album. And I had uh, conducted some other research trips to Germany prior to COVID, although. What, what was interesting is is that out of all of the um, the uh, the institutions and the archives and libraries that were shut down during COVID, ones in Germany remained open, and so I was able to reach out to the Bibliothek für Zeitgeschichte in Stuttgart, and they were very happy to provide me photos. Uh, and one of the more interesting locations that I was able to obtain photographs uh, from was the city of Karlsruhe. And so I think right. some folks might know that uh, when the war started, uh, many of the U-boats uh, had been participating in what they call the partnership program, where they would get a, a sponsoring city to sponsor those U-boats. And uh, really, the, 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 the city's responsibility was 
to provide them care packages for the most part. But in many cases, these, these U-boats would adopt the symbols of the cities. And there was a, a number of strong connections between von Fosner and the city of Karlsruhe, as well as among uh, some of the crew, like Friebelin, who was also born um, outside of Karlsruhe. So he wrote to, to the mayor of the city um, and the, the mayor agreed to be the sponsor uh, for you for two. And so when I reached out to Karlsruhe, I had no idea if they would have any information about this. And they did. They had some interesting photographs. They had some interesting documents, uh, including some of the, uh, the correspondence between the mayor of Karlsruhe and von Foster and von Foster's uh, wife. And they were absolutely thrilled to make all of this data available to me you know, while everybody else was was shut down, they were still open, right? And so, so a lot of that became part of the book and was published for the first time. Uh, that's that's uh, that's really really interesting, and uh, yeah, wow, um, yeah, the way you describe it, just fortuitous how you were able to to pull it all off uh, in in that time frame. Um, so uh, so let's get to the book. Um, tell us a little bit about Baron Siegfried von Forstner. So he is he is an interesting individual. Um, He's for, very interesting, for, yeah, for for many reasons, right? Um, he comes from a uh, an aristocratic family that had a long tradition of military history. His father served in the First World War and won the Blue Max. Um, his uncle, uh, I want to make sure I get his name right. I think it's uh, Georg von Bosner. He uh, joined the uh, the Navy. Uh, in the, during the First World War, but he was in the Navy before the First World War even broke out. I mean, he was in submarines, and he was the first commander of U-1. He was uh, subsequently the, the commander of U-7, and during the, the war, he was commander of U-28. And so, in many respects, his uncle pioneered uh, submarine warfare uh, from the German perspective and would write a number of books about his experiences, uh, one of which was translated during the war and made available uh, in England for the first time. And this was the first time anybody had read anything about what it was like to be a captain on a, on a, on a German uh, submarine during the First World War. So um, von Foster, I think, had a lot of influence from his uncle because both he and his brother would ultimately join um, the uh, the Kriegsmarine. In fact, before it was even called the Kriegsmarine, uh, they they joined the Navy or very early in uh, 1930, even before the rise of National Socialism uh, in Germany. And so, you know, Ewan Foster was probably a nationalist, um, but he certainly was no National Socialist. And he uh, really took to the Navy profession. He had always wanted to uh, be in the U-boats, but it would take him almost 10 years of service before that would happen. Now, interestingly enough, when he joined, another another very famous uh, uh, later Kriegsmarine officer had joined uh, virtually at the same time, and that was Otto Kretschmer. And so the two of them spent the first several years of their careers really tied together, going through the same training school, serving on very many of the same vessels. But uh, Kretschmer would ultimately uh, move into U-boats uh, earlier than von Foster did. Now, for 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 von Foster, he um, when he when he entered when he finally got assigned uh, a U-boat and uh, U-402, he was a little senior, and so normally you would spend a lot more time. Uh, being a watch officer on multiple patrols, but yes. that didn't that he couldn't do that because of his rank, and so that's where he was granted uh, the ability to be a third watch officer on one of Kretschmer's patrols. And then the minute he returned, he ultimately was assigned to uh, to U four hundred two, and so that was his first and only U boat. And you can see how uh, you know in the early part of career of his career, he uh, was still working out. Uh, the tactical procedures, learning how to you know manage his crew and 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 the U-boat itself, and it wouldn't be until later on, uh, until his fourth patrol, fifth patrol, where he really came into his own, and he not only you know mastered the art of command, and he understood his his professional side of being a, uh, a U-boat commander, but he had a really innate ability to understand his enemy. 
He understood what their capabilities were. He understood destroyer escorts, how they worked, what their tactical procedures were. And um, as, as one of his later chroniclers uh, and, and former uh, adversaries would remark, there was never going to be a surface escort that was going to get him because he could outmaneuver them on the surface, uh, which he did continually. He never really liked to dive because he knew when he did in a convoy battle, it would almost uh, guarantee that he would lose sight of the convoy, lose contact with the convoy. And so he was more apt to outmaneuver any escorts on the surface so that he could get back to doing what he was there to do, which was sink, sink vessels. And one of the most amazing things to me about him is that he would put on um, almost the single best 24-hour performance of any U-boat commander um, of the war. Uh, he, would, he would be just a few thousand tons shy of doing it. But for him, the Battle of SC-118 uh, was a uh, fairly remarkable uh, combat experience because he would end up sinking seven vessels in less than 24 hours. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and, and that had not been done for almost two and a half years, right? And the reason why is because it was just getting increasingly difficult during the Battle of the Atlantic to, 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 to sink that many ships with the increasing uh, use of um, uh, Allied aircraft with that were radar equipped, uh, in, 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 you know, the uh, ultra and uh, direction finding and just the increasing technical uh, proficiency of the Allied escorts in finding and sinking U-boats. It was uh, unheard of to see this kind of performance, and yet he he pulled it off. So, you know, and, and he didn't do it because he was just lucky. I mean, he created his own luck because of the reasons I've already described, yeah. which really makes an interesting, making him an interesting character study from a, from a, a perspective of a U-boat commander. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every, everything he said, um, he, uh, he is somebody who just has an innate ability to understand his enemy. And, and I'll say this, uh, you know, so many of the biographies and stuff that I've read, the uh, most of the U-boat captains really didn't understand that the Allies were using uh, huff duff, uh, you know, high frequency uh, direction finding uh, on the ships, and that led them that that them not understanding how the Allies could uh, triangulate and home in on them very very quickly, just led to a lot of confusion on on the Kriegsmarine side about like the technology that the technologies that uh, that the allies were employing. However, in this book, Forstner pretty clearly understands that the allies are using a precision uh, radio direction finding because he there comes a point where uh, he just knows that, hey, every time we send a transmission within like a minute, I have a destroyer barreling down on me. Like, you know, like he, he figured that out and he, he could actually use it to his advantage and just kind of play with the escorts. Um, and I think the other, the other interesting thing about him is that, um, your, his early war patrols, they, they really weren't successful. Um, and that was probably one, a little bit to, you know, he's new to the job, uh, two, it's not until the end of 1942 that the Germans really solved the, uh, the problems with their pistols on, on their torpedoes. Um, and, uh. His, his boat was just filled with gremlins. The, the diesels are just a, they're just a constant source of frustration to him for, for the entirety um, of, his, of his time uh, with, with the U-402. But uh, as he said, it's finally, you know, the, the, so the first four war patrols aren't really significant, but he gets, everything comes together and he hits that stride and, uh, and he does amazing work under extremely difficult conditions. Yeah, um, and, and I'm going to just jump in and, and, and underscore that as well because that's something I didn't I didn't really mention. But yeah, U-402 was played with Gremlins from the minute it was yeah. it was commissioned, right? Yeah, and it, it is amazing to see him uh, deal with uh, the loss of his engines and having to do these repairs Constantly. in the middle of the Atlantic at sea <laughs> while underwater, changing. Yeah. you know, bearings and changing all sorts of components and jury rigging his engines so that he can get back into, uh, get into battle. And he never once gave up, right? So right. even under the most dire circumstances where 
you know, you'd think that any other any other person at this point would say, OK, I, I you know, we can't go on. Uh, they found a way to piece together whatever the technical issue was and uh, and, and continue can continue the fight, which is uh, pretty fascinating when you when you read it. So I didn't even I was not even aware of that until I really got into yeah. uh, the, the the U-Boat log and, and read it myself. Yeah. Um which kind of tries home the point that if you had to lose your captain or your chief engineer, you'd, you'd probably want to, you'd probably want to lose your captain. You really can't yeah. replace the chief engineer. You need that guy. Absolutely. Um, so I have a, so I have one final question and uh, l- let me, let me frame it like this. There comes a point and I don't remember which war patrol it was, but there comes a point where uh, they, they sink a merchant ship and uh, they actually fish two survivors out of the water. And I don't, I think they were British. I think they were British sailors. I can't remember. No, those are the first two U.S. Navy prisoners yeah, the, of the war. Yeah, the first Battle two Atlantic. U.S. Navy. And uh, so these guys are swimming in the water. They see this U-boat coming up to them. And in their minds, they're like, okay, this is it. They're going to finish us off. And uh, the crew actually fishes them out of the water. And they're, and they're up on deck. And, and Forstner greets them. And uh, they look at him and they, the, the U.S. Navy sailors, they look at him and say, why, why didn't you machine gun us? And F- Forstner is kind of taken aback, almost insulted that, and he makes the point to them that, you know, this is not how we fight a war. And, uh, you know, I, I think that speaks to his, to his character. But so the question for you is, um, what do you want people to take away from this book, Night of the North Atlantic? Well, you know, besides reading about the crew and Von Foster, what I wanted to do with this book, and I, I hope readers take away, is how their experience fits into the broader uh, mosaic of the Battle of the Atlantic, especially with the changing and evolving technology, uh, the 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 intelligence war that's going on between B Deans, excuse me, B Deans. Royal Navy and U.S. Navy, where, you know, ultra uh, factors in. Uh, And I tried to really, you know, show how, you know, all of these factors sort of played in. And the crew and the captain never understood these things, right? But they were there in the middle of the Battle of the Atlantic dealing with all of these evolving changes. And and I really wanted to give that perspective of of how, how they fought. In, in during the fought how they fought during the Battle of the Atlantic while while there all of these influences that they really didn't understand were were, were at play uh, for them and so you know I really wanted to sort of give you that broad uh, panoramic and 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 put you in in the eyes of you know this this German U boat um, crew and captain as they were uh, you know out there um, dealing with it yeah. So your book is, uh, it's published in the UK by Seaforth Publishing, and here in the United States, it's it's printed and being distributed by the United States Naval Institute Press. Correct. Um, do you have, uh, do you have any, before we close out, do you have any upcoming projects you want to talk about real quick? Um, the only thing I would mention, and maybe we could do a subject of a of another interview down the road here, yeah. is um, I'm currently serving as the, uh, the primary investigator of a grant funded survey of the U1105 of the Potomac River. Uh, okay. So I've already written a book on 1105, but uh, this is the first comprehensive maritime archaeological survey in 25 years, and uh, there's uh, additional interesting facets of that U boat that um, we're going to hopefully you know, bring to print and, and publish and when we're done with the survey here uh, next year. So stay tuned for, for more on that. Well, Aaron S. Hamilton, uh, thank you very much for joining us here on Submarine History and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again down the road. Thank you, Steve. It was a pleasure. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the briefing and we'll come back again. Feel free to contact me via email. I am on Discord, Twitter, and I do have a Patreon. Thanks to USNI for doing the job they do so well. Their publishing arm is an invaluable resource to the preservation of naval history. Consider becoming a member so their work can continue long into the future. Till next time, peace out.